Hey there, do you dream of escaping into a book? Maybe your escape includes a cozy cabin in the mountains or a magical town along the coast. Either way, you're in the right place. Welcome to Literary Escapes with me, Becky. This year on the podcast, we're exploring the United States. So every week I'm going to bring you a new book set in a different state. So let's see where we're going today. Welcome back to the Literary Escapes podcast. We are continuing our trek across the United States. And this week will be week 33 of our adventure. And we are visiting Nebraska. Our tour guide this week is Kelly Brakenhoff. Is that how I say your last name, Brakenhoff? Um, People say it all different kinds of ways. Well, how do you say it? Brockenhoff. They say Brockenhoff. Okay, yeah. okay. <laughs> Welcome, Kelly. I'm, I'm really glad you're here today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited. I I can honestly say I know nothing about Nebraska. I've been through <laughs> at least through a lot of states, and I don't think I've been through Nebraska. I know that the corn huskers are in Nebraska and that they're Big Ten. And that because my yeah. husband is an Iowa guy that we don't root for Nebraska. So <laughs> that is the extent of my knowledge. So I apologize for bringing that to the table so early. <laughs> no worries. There's definitely some rivalry about maybe who has the better corn, but you know, it's okay. We don't exactly. have to go there. <laughs> Being a Florida girl, I don't care about any of that. So <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> so tell me, I'm, I'm guessing that your experience with Nebraska is a little bit different than mine. So tell me about Nebraska and what you love about it and what I should know about it. Wow. Um, I know we have a only a short time on our podcast, so I have to <laughs> pick and choose what I exactly. say. Exactly. Um, Nebraska is such a unique place. Unfortunately, like you said, most people only experience it from a car on Interstate 80 or looking down from 20,000 feet from an airplane window. Right. But I've been here most of my life in pieces mm-hmm. and it su- could surprise you. It's got a lot of hidden gems. Um, we have everything from Carhenge, which is like Stonehenge, but with cars. I've heard of that. I didn't know it was in Nebraska. It's a thing. It's a thing. And then we have a really beautiful, large Lake McConaughey, which is great for like a summer vacation. Uh, Our largest waterfall is called Smith Falls. It's in a beautiful valley with lots of trees. Most people think that uh, Nebraska is flat and has no trees, but there are parts of Nebraska that are hilly and have beautiful trees. Do you have hills? Or There are. No mountains. Okay, but because I was thinking remotely begin to call a mountain, but we have hills and lots of rolling hills. But um, the northwestern area, especially kind of as you get up towards South Dakota, has has quite a few more hills and bluffs and that kind of thing. Okay, because I'm thinking Um, if you have a waterfall, you need some you know somewhere for it to fall down. So (laughs) yeah, right, right. So Um, there's also a. There's a Willa Cather house. So if you're a literary buff and follow Willa Cather, um, her like homestead is a great tourist thing. Very cool. um, my, one of my favorite things is the Henry Dordley Zoo, which is actually one of the best zoos in the world. I was nice. just there last weekend and I can highly recommend it to anyone. It was super crowded, probably with a lot of tourists. And then of course, like you mentioned, if you're a football fan, Memorial Stadium on game day with its 90,000 fans becomes the third largest city in Nebraska. Isn't that insane? Holy moly. Yep. Nebraska, that that is amazing, actually. <laughs> I had no idea all, it had all <laughs> yeah, of that going like on for it. Omaha, Lincoln, the stadium. That's like the order of the largest. Oh my gosh. Cities. Yeah. But I think what really makes Nebraska special is the friendly people, the Midwestern culture. Nice. Most of my family lives here. Nice. Um, and then one kind of cool thing I put in my mystery novels, um, a restaurant called Runza Restaurant. It's a chain in this area. Okay. So if you think of like bread pocket, I think it comes from like Bohemian, kind of European okay. area a lot of immigrants are from. And it's a bread pocket stuffed with beef and cabbage. Mm. 
There's a whole restaurant chain. And it's called, called R-U-N-Z-A? R-U-N-Z-A. Renza, yep. I'm going to have to look that up. That sounds really good. So, good. so if you come to Nebraska, you must stop and get a Renza. <laughs> will do. Will do. That sounds really good. <laughs> I'm hungry now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So I saw that you are an ASL interpreter, American Sign Language, and that is so cool. I What type of situations do you sign for? Because I know that interpreters yeah. work, you know, from Everywhere. the government to Taylor Swift, so... We and do. Everything we in do. Between. Unfortunately, I have not interpreted for a Taylor Swift concert. <laughs> but if she comes to Nebraska, I will volunteer. That would be an amazing sure. experience. That would be really fun. That um, would be a ton of fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have done like plays and uh, concerts and stuff. Not Taylor Swift, but yeah, other concerts. Um, I do, yeah, just pretty much anything you can imagine from medical appointments to conferences mm-hmm. to... My main gig that I usually do is I work at the University of Nebraska um, in uh, like for students or faculty, like classes or meetings or whatever. So that's, oh. that's mostly what I do. Very cool. Now I spend a lot of time writing. So I tried to narrow down a little bit uh, some of the interpreting. Yeah. That. yeah. That is so interesting. Huh. I, I, yeah. How did you get into the ASL and interpreting? When I was in high school, I had some friends that were deaf and I learned some sign language and I just kind of kept learning through college. And then eventually, I don't know, I didn't really ever intend to do that. I thought I was going to be the great American writer. I majored in English, (laughs) but it turned out that um, interpreting actually makes you money. So (laughs) there is a a very long time. There is a reality check there. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah, it wasn't until much later in life that my kids were, I have four kids and they were all getting grown up and I finally just got to do the thing that I always wanted to do. That is so cool. So let's, let's talk about that. You went from being a mom and interpreter to an author. Um, how did that go? Um, it actually started with, um, well, like I said, it was a long winding journey, but it started, um, as a NaNoWriMo project in 2014. Ah, nice. Um, it wasn't uh, published until 2019. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. I guess I've always, I don't know. I just, I've always read mysteries. That's my favorite genre. So that's okay. what I Yeah, read. I was going to ask about that. Okay. Yeah. So my novels are actually set at Morton College in a fictional town in Nebraska. Um, nice. Yeah, I, I was people at work, you know. The yeah. idea of um academic cozy mystery is super intriguing. I love the college setting. I think that's yeah. it lends itself to so much interesting opportunities for a cozy mystery. Absolutely. There's so I think it lends itself to all kinds of stories because mm-hmm you're bringing together people from all different walks of life and all different perspectives and throwing them together on this small closed campus. Yeah. And then like from the faculty perspective, you throw in all the rivalries and competitiveness and everything. And so, yeah, it's just kind of a whole situation right for either romance or <laughs> killing people. So exactly. I, chose the so, killing people part, I don't blame part, yeah. you. That seems like a perfect choice. It's a <laughs> A perfect cauldron of all kinds of good stuff brewing mm-hmm. there. So I like mm-hmm. that. I um, so your first book is Death by Dissertation, right? Is right, that actually right. the first book that you published, or um? Yes, um, okay. it took me five years from that NaNoWriMo project to uh to get there. Nice. Um, and I kind of went through the traditional uh agent querying and all of that and then as I got got into that I really started also looking into uh becoming my own publisher and mm-hmm. so I started a publishing company and just nice yeah haven't really looked back ever since then good for you definitely for me I'm a control freak and I I, I have certain ideas about how I think should things should be done and so I've just found that for me it's been perfect I love that 
I love that. I love that there are options in publishing. And if you like to have control, if you have like super specific ideas of what you want, there is an option for that. And Mm -hmm. I think that's amazing. And it's, yeah, I think that's pretty awesome. And cozy mysteries are one of my favorite genre. I, I write sweet romance, but I love cozy mysteries and it's, it's kind of a dream to one day be able to write one. I'm not sure if I know how to do that or not, but I really want to try one day. So I love talking to authors who do that. Um, yeah. When you write, do you know who done it? <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> I do. Sometimes I think I do. And then I get to the end and like, so I'll usually start off with several options. Yeah. And then we kind of narrow it down. And then sometimes I'll get to the end and be like, no, that doesn't feel right. So then I either have to go back and fix some of the clues or fix some of it. But yeah. um, I have gotten better at trying to figure those things out ahead of time since the more books I write, but yeah. um, it's still hard. And I think it's definitely one of the harder genres to write just to be able to think so. I yeah. Mysteries and thrillers. And I don't want someone to be able to guess it right away. I want yeah. someone to keep turning pages until, and that they solve the puzzle alongside of my sleuth. Yeah. So yeah. As a reader, kinda... it's so disappointing when you figure it out early on. Cause I love mm-hmm. when an author can keep me guessing up until that last moment. I think that's brilliant. I love that. So I love yeah. it when they can too. And sometimes, uh, yeah, I feel like that's always my challenge. That's always in the back of my head of like, okay, you have to add another twist here. You have to add another <laughs> twist here. That's awesome. I love that. It's, um, It's funny because I have a friend who writes and the process of like how much you put down ahead of time changes as you go through more than one book. You figure out what you really need to know, what you want to learn along the way, that kind of thing. And so I, that's interesting to hear that, you know, it changes as you go through multiple books. So that's totally agree with that. Totally agree. And, but I still like, I'm, I'm kind of a discovery writer. I, I start off the first half. I kind of know where I'm going, but then I find out a lot of things as I go. Mm-hmm. And so I tried a couple times to just have this outline. I read how to do it correctly. And, and then I never followed it. So then finally <laughs> after, like, I think my last book in this book, it's like, you know what, if I'm not going to follow it, why write it? So yeah. I just kind of have my I things I know I want to hit and then I'm just going to, I just write. <laughs> well, and at this point you probably have like a good feel for the pacing of the story and when things yeah. need to be revealed and that kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and I, this is the, I'm writing right now the fifth book in the series and I've written like four short stories also in the same world. Yeah. So I know my world really well. I know my characters pretty well. So Nice. Um, that definitely helps a lot when you write in a series. And that's nice. kind of one of the benefits of cozy writing is they almost are always in a series. Yeah. And so, yeah. That's, um, yeah, that's one of the things that I love about them. And, and I also like that the character, the main character, because typically there's a character who's your main one through the series you know, most of the time it's a female who isn't supposed to be an investigator but yeah. we get to see her grow versus mm-hmm. moving to a brand new character, brand new couple each, you know, each time. Yeah. And so that's one of the things I love about cozies is you get to stay with the same person and grow with them throughout the books. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Love. Like one of my favorite mystery series is the Janet Ivanovich series. Oh, yeah. Numbers. Yeah. Um, you know, one for the money and all that. And yeah, it, it's been, you kind of feel like, you know, the people. And I mean, I think she's up to 27, 28 books. Now. I think I and saw so, 30 the other day. Oh, I think you're probably right. And so, yeah, I kind of feel like every summer I just go on vacation to Trenton, New Jersey and see all my old friends there. And so I kind of want people to feel that way I love that. when they come to my, my little yeah. town in Nebraska. I love that. <laughs> I love that. So what's the name of your little town? Carson, Nebraska, named after famous Johnny Carson, who Ooh. is from Nebraska. Awesome. Okay. Yep. 
Carson, yeah. Nebraska. I like that. And Morton College. Yep. He's another fam- I kind of spent before I, I totally geeked out on Nebraska history. So all the buildings, all the everything are all named after like famous Nebraskans. So oh, I love that. Yeah. People from here love to read them because I just throw in all the Easter eggs. All the of, cool stuff. Yeah. That the they cool know. Stuff. Yeah. That's fun. I like that. Very cool. So the other thing that's kind of weird about my books, well, I don't know if it's weird, but <laughs> um, you learn about Nebraska history and culture, but um, my main character, Cassandra, is actually from Hawaii. Oh. I lived there for five years. And so I thought how fun it would be to take someone from Nebraska, from Hawaii and have her get her dream job in Nebraska. <laughs> and- <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> Nothing know, against right? Nebraska. <laughs> Yes, I mean, nobody would do that, right? No one would take a job. No one would do that. But it was kind of a fun, like, fictional question of, like, okay, how would that look, you know? Um, (laughs) So she's, yeah, she's kind of a fish out of water. Um, She took her dream job. It hasn't turned out the way she thought, you know. But so you also get, like, Hawaiian culture because since it's told from her point of view, like she spends a lot of time talking about the difference between Hawaii and Nebraska. Oh, that's then cool. I also throw in this third thing. Um, I all, all my books have deaf characters and American Sign Language in them. I so love that. I, because of my job as an interpreter, I kind of stick all of that in there too. So people get like three cultures for the price of one. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that's very cool. That's what a interesting combo. And to educate your readers about the deaf community and Mm -hmm. yeah I I think that's really cool and you also have another series that's for children about the deaf community yeah so you know I started off my first book was a mystery but then I kind of had a realization of like what about stories for kids who are deaf or hard of hearing and I went and did research and the, there's a huge gap on the bookshelves Wow. Of, of either characters who are deaf or hard of hearing, or even just things that aren't condescending right. or things that are not like, um, oh, poor me, or, oh, you know, we're going to save you or all that kind of thing. And since I basically lived two thirds of my life in the deaf community, I have a lot of opinions on how how things are. And like, I want hearing people to understand what deaf people's lives are like. I love that. I also think that every child should see themselves in stories. And so definitely started my series. It's called Duke, the deaf dog. Um, So it introduces kids to deaf culture, American sign language. Um, But it's, it's really fun. Um, on the end of all the, like on some of the pages in the books, there's signs so kids can learn how, signs yeah, and how to make them yeah. and stories and lesson plans and stuff. So teachers love them because they can just yeah. take like my lesson plan and my book and then they don't have to, they, they can like teach about this topic yeah. in an informed way. So that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. I, um, for a short time worked in a elementary school library and I was thinking that this would have been something really cool to introduce to the kids. They would have thoroughly loved that. They would still, you know, thoroughly love that. So yeah, yeah. I'm going I'm to email my good. librarian and see if she <laughs> has heard of your series. So yeah, most of my, my sales and targets and stuff are schools and libraries. Um, a lot of parents like them too, but uh, it's definitely like a good discussion. It's good for deaf kids because they can see their own characters and their own experiences right. on the pages. But it's really good for all kids just to kind of mm-hmm. understand what it's like to be on the other side yeah. and, and understand both. How and to be a good like, friend or a yeah. classmate to someone who might have a hearing disability. So, yeah. Right, right. So, yeah, yeah. I, they're kind of my passion project. Um, yeah. I love doing them. But I also like my my cozies are kind of my my yeah. fun for me. And that's something like I've always wanted to do. And then the the children's books are, I don't know. That's so I fun. Think. What a really yeah. uh, interesting mix of um, the two, two books. I mean, I like that you have the deaf community that, that binds them together, but um, 
you know, kids books, adult books, they don't seem like they would fit together, but obviously they do. So they're very different genres. I've had to learn a lot. I have a really big team of people who help me. Um, Obviously I have to have illustrators, you know, I have my cover designer and I had to get different editors for the kids books. Right. um, Used for my adult books. Um, I, I have uh, deaf friends and whatever that write and contribute to the books. And so, um, you know, just getting involved, including a bunch of different perspectives. Yeah. So it's been really fun to work with a team because yeah, writing is kind of a solitary thing. But then once I do the implementation where I do the whole publishing part, that's like this big team of people who make it happen. And that yeah. has actually been super, super fun. That's awesome. I like that. Do you, does your publishing company thus far only publish you? So far, you're good. You, you see where I'm going. <laughs> I love that. I I would love yeah. someday to be able, like I, I, I've been doing this for five years and I feel like I'm just now kind of figuring out my systems of, especially with the children's books. And so I would love in the future to be able to publish uh, deaf authors and deaf illustrators. That would be so cool. Um, I'm hoping to do like some kind of contest with students, you know, maybe start just in Nebraska yeah. and then maybe expand and have like a writing contest for students mm-hmm. and then maybe like publish in an anthology, some of their work. That would be so again, cool. Wouldn't it be so cool to hear? Cause we have, we do, we, we do so much talking about people's own voices and own experiences. And so I would love to be able to help that along, you know, them, yeah. like a way that people could do that. And then people, other people could experience what their firsthand stories are. I like that. I like your dream. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I it happens. A, yeah. I hope so too. It's really a big, it's a big dream. I keep, you know, how yeah. you have things that are like so big that you don't know if you can do it, but wouldn't it be cool if I could? That would be so cool. And yeah, I, I, I look forward to when it happens. So I think that'll be super awesome. And we'll talk yeah. again when when we I would uh, love to. talk yeah. about one of your anthologies or something like that. I think that would yeah. be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I would love to. So what are you working on right now? Because I know there's always uh, something going on. Yeah, I'm. this has been a, a season of uh, lots of work, but with very little to show for it so far. <laughs> um, the first six months of the year, I wrote four chapter books in this Duke the Deaf Dog series. So they're like second grade, early okay. kind of book. Oh, I love that. Yeah. So now I'm just doing all the back matter and getting all those ready to publish this fall. But then this month I'm working on my fifth Cassandra Sato mystery. And this is a fun book because um, she takes a group of students on kind of a study abroad trip back to Hawaii. Oh. Where she came from. So we get to see her family and we get to see Hawaii. And how fun. So it's fun because imagine taking a group of students from Nebraska and how, again, culture shock exactly. and everything. <laughs> yeah. And of oh, course, that's fun. we have to solve a murder mystery. So that happens in Hawaii too. So yeah, it's, oh, that's it's been fun. fun for me just because I get to go back and experience all my yeah. favorite places. Yeah. That's fun. Do your, um, books have food as part of them I know some of the cozy mysteries I mean typically they're ones that are like centered around a bakery or something but I'm yeah yeah because I was just thinking about Hawaiian food and (laughs) my center around food in that Cassandra likes to eat okay and she has to cook a meal sometimes but no um yeah there's definitely like a whole section of cozy mysteries like about cats and pets and then bakeries and bookstores and that kind of thing um and so I think mine is probably more of a traditional mystery in that it's you know set at a college and it's kind of like a closed society closed community kind of Mm -hmm. a thing like an Agatha Christie kind of a I love that the reason it's cozy or why we call it cozy is kind of like with sweet romance where there's no like swearing on the page Mm -hmm. there's no sex on the page um, there's no, there's like, none of the, the murder death. gore on the page. Yeah. yeah. There's no gore. So like usually yeah. the, um, the violence happens off screen mm-hmm. and then you just read about it afterwards. Yeah. So that's why like 
that's more of a traditional cozy kind of a mystery. So they don't yeah. all have to have a bakery, but yes, we all do. <laughs> no, like- I, yeah, that's true. I just, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're right though. I mean, definitely that's the majority. You would think though, by like the bookshelves that there's a cupcake bakery on every corner. <laughs> And I'm disappointed that there's not. (laughs) (laughs) I know it's like when you watch the Hallmark movies, you know, and everything has the main street with the, yeah. Yeah. That's so funny. I love it. (laughs) Hey, it sells, right? That's what people want to read about. We want an escape. We want to be entertained. We want, yeah, we want to go somewhere like your, your book club, you know, you want to go visit all these places and get to learn about places in the culture, but without actually leaving my, yes, my cozy chair. Yes. I absolutely agree with that. That's the beauty of books. That is for sure. So what are you reading Definitely. right now? Where, where wow, is your book taking you to? My book. So I'm actually reading right now. Um, one of my friend's books, she writes historical cozy mystery. And actually Ooh. she just wrote a Oh, you might like this. <laughs> it's called, there's one called the first or the, the missing diamond. And it's billed as Bridgerton meets a mystery. And oh. so it's like a Regency mystery. Um, the author is Lynn Morrison and Anne Radcliffe. It just came out kind of timed with Bridgerton. Fun. And it's so fun because you kind of get the the balls and the dresses and the the debutantes and all that, but with a mystery instead of the spice, <laughs> yeah. Instead of the spice or the the angst about finding a husband, you get the the mystery part of it. And so that sounds like fun. There's two books available now, and I think the third will be available later this summer. But oh man, the missing diamond was so fun. I had so much fun because it was like I did like watching Bridgerton, and so then to be able to read a book. That kind of starts there, but then goes off on its own. Yeah, thing. own little tangent. I like that. Yeah, it was fun. Oh, that's awesome. I, I wrote it down. I'm going to check it out for sure. Oh, you should. I highly, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and does that take place over in Europe, in England or? Yes, is it, in okay. London, yeah. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. That'll be fun to read. Oh, yeah. You'll have to let me know. Let me know what you think, because I thought it was so much fun. I absolutely will. I absolutely will. Kelly, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a lot of fun talking to you, getting to know your books and your state. So I appreciate that. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. It was really fun chatting with you. Yeah, you too. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Thanks for joining me today. If you'd like to be part of the Read Across the U.S. Book Club, I'd love to have you join us. There is a link in the show notes. So just head down there and click and we will welcome you in. So see you in the book club, I hope. Have a great day and we'll see you next week with a new episode.